There we go. Most excellent. Okay, Matthew chapter 23 is where we're going to be uh, at tonight. Hopefully getting through the whole chapter. We've got a lot to cover. So Lord, we just pray you'd bless our time in your word. And uh, may you just communicate to your people the, the things that um, you want us to hear, that you want us to glean from your word. Speak to us as only you can. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Matthew 23, this is a uh, heartwarming uh, message called Woes to Whitewashed Tombs. Woes to, woes to Whitewashed Tombs. Wow, it's a heavy chapter. And here Jesus confronts the religious leaders of the day in a very profound and powerful way. He calls them out on their hypocrisy. And, and hypocrisy is a word that is used over and over in this chapter, and it's really the theme of it. And if there was one sin, one way to just, you know, describe these religious leaders in Jesus's day is that of hypocrites, Pharisees, who were, uh, you know, presenting themselves one way <clears throat> and yet living in a completely inconsistent way. We're, we'll look at that in more detail. So, you can always learn from an example, uh, whether it's something to emulate or something to avoid. And in this case, we're going to be looking at a lot of things to avoid. And uh, as the Lord ministers to us, if there's maybe an area in your life where um, you, you realize, man, I'm kind of like that. Uh, may God just give you the grace and the strength, the wisdom to, to turn from that, to repent of it, and uh, that we would just live and walk in purity. We'll also be kind of contrasting, you know, the way that the Pharisees were to the way that our Savior Jesus is and just seeing the glory and the beauty of who he is. So, Let's get into it. We'll look at the first seven verses, uh, which really describe <clears throat> the sin of hypocrisy. Matthew 23, verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. So Jesus, uh, the first part of this chapter is going to be speaking about the Pharisees. Uh, then the, about verse 13 on to the end of the chapter, he'll speak, be speaking directly to the Pharisees. And so here he's really warning the multitudes, warning his disciples about these religious leaders. And he speaking to the, the Pharisees. These were the very um, they were very conservative. Uh, they, they believed that God's word was inspired. They, um, they thought that they were really doing God uh, a, a favor by their strict rules and the, the, the ways that they operated and you know, high standards that they put on themselves and on other people. But they were very mistaken, as we will see. The scribes, they were like lawyers. They were experts in God's word. They had a large portion, if not the whole thing, committed to memory. They knew the word inside and out. But sadly, there was a great void. There was this 18-inch uh, separation from the head to the heart. There was a, a black hole, as it were. And it, the two were separated. There was a chasm. And while they had much knowledge about God, their hearts were very far from him, as we will see. Jesus says they sit in the seat of Moses. So yeah, they knew the word of God and they taught it. And to the degree that they taught it uh, well, to the degree that they were faithful to the text, Jesus says, yes, observe that. Obey God's word. However, they are not the example to follow. They say, but they do not do. And that is exactly what hypocrisy is. That's the essence of it, right? <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Have you heard that before? Maybe you've said it before. I, oh, I, I've joked before and, and said that with my kids, you know. But, but man, we don't want to be that way. And that's what these Pharisees were all about. And, and Jesus explains this 
in great detail. Uh, verse 4, what is, what is hypocrisy? What did it look like? For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They lay heavy trips on people. They condemn people. They load people down with weights, things to do, uh, you know, these, the minutia of the law that actually wasn't directly, you know, direct laws from God's word, but they would add to the word of God their own traditions. And these traditions were heavy weights and they put them on people. They would convict people of their sin and condemn people of their sin, but do nothing about it, seeking to help or counsel them through it, seeking to help them out of it, you see. They laid heavy religious trips on folks. Man, I'm so thankful that our Lord is the exact opposite. Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 says this, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this is what the Lord does. He takes the weight of our sin, the burden of our, our guilt and our shame, and he exchanges it. He took it on himself on the cross and bore our sins in his body. And what does he give us in exchange? His light burden, his yoke, which is really this idea of us being yoked up to him. And it's, a, a, it's really a non-burden. It's like a, a life buoy in, in the midst of the, the raging sea. <laughs> a life vest. Jesus gives us buoyancy. He, he lifts us. And so this is the heart of Christ. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 tells us as well, brethren, if any man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The, the Pharisees, you know, just put all kinds of weight on other people. What is the heart of Jesus? What is to fulfill the law of Christ, which is to love one another? It's to come alongside people who are struggling, who are hurting, who are needy, who are messy, <laughs> and to have mercy on them, to have compassion upon them, because that is the heart of the Lord. And rather than just saying, look at that filthy, disgusting person over there, Look at this person. Look at that person. You know, how, you know, this kind of us and them attitude. It's far from the heart of Christ. It's foreign to, to the scripture. What's Jesus say to do? Come and, and get underneath that burden with them. Help them. Lighten their load. Pray for them. Seek to minister to them the grace of God. Counsel them. You see, this, that's the heart of the Lord. And that, that should be our heart as well, shouldn't it? So fulfill the law of Christ. Jesus is our burden bearer, bearing our sins in his own body upon the tree. That's 1 Peter 2, 24. So quite the opposite of these religious leaders is our Lord. Back to verse 5, continuing to explain and expound upon their hypocrisy. Verse 5, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They were self-promoters. They looked for any subtle way to promote themselves, to exalt themselves in the eyes of people because what they really hungered and thirsted for was not the honor of God, but the honor of others. That's what gave them a sense of worth or worthiness was the attaboys and the pats on the back. That's what they looked for. That's what they wanted. And, um, and Jesus says they do it in quite a, I mean, it's a comical way. The phylacteries, what are those? Well, they are these um, strips they would tie around their hands 
and they would tie a, kind of like a box to their forehead. And they used them during prayer. And what was on these, um, they could be made of leather or other types of materials, were scriptures. And it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, where it says, you shall bind the law, you know, um, to your heart, essentially. That's the, um, the essence. You know, bind the law on your forehead and, and on your hands. And, and what God is saying is, I want my law to always be on your head, on your mind, rather. I want you to always be thinking about it and, and meditating upon it within your heart. But they took it very literally. And so during their times of prayer, they would wrap these things around their hands and tie these things on their head as a show and a demonstration of, hey, we're taking God's word seriously and we're praying now. And I actually saw this. I was on an airplane one time flying to Israel on El Al Airlines. It's the, the uh, airlines for Israel. And I'm just chilling and, um, you know, it's very dark outside and I uh, can't sleep. And I thankfully had this nice exit row seat. And so there was kind of some space in front of me. And uh, all of a sudden, this guy gets up and he uh, starts pulling out his phylacteries. <laughs> and he, he ties these things around his, his arms and his head and he, you know, starts, you know, kind of bobbing back and forth, kind of getting into a rhythm, I guess, of his re, um, reciting his prayers. And I thought, well, that's what it is. They're still doing it, right? Which, on one hand, there's, there's nothing necessarily wrong with, with the practice, but Jesus is saying, what they're doing is they're making these phylacteries big. So rather than it just being a simple box, maybe the guy would have a big box on his head. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. You know, big, you know, real, uh, you know, emphasizing. Okay, I'm going to, hey, everybody, I'm going to pray now. I'm getting ready to pray because I'm so spiritual, right? And, and look at my beautiful phylacteries. <laughs> it's like, sounds kind of funny to say it that way, doesn't it? Um, so that's what they were doing. And then it says they enlarged the borders of their garments. This, uh, this comes from uh, Numbers chapter 15, where the Lord directs them to have tassels on their garments. And as they would see the tassels, it would be a reminder that we are set apart for the Lord. So again, nothing necessarily wrong with the, the visual representation, so long as the inward reality was there. Problem was, for these people, the inward reality was not there. And that was the hypocrisy. Oh, they made their tassels long. We are set apart for God. I am a man of God. Look at these tassels. Aren't they great? Aren't they beautiful? You know, my designer tassels. <laughs> it, we laugh at it now. But see, that's what they were doing, these kind of subtle things to promote themselves in the eyes of people. And Jesus says, it's hypocrisy. They do all their work to be seen by others, e emphasizing external appearance. Oh, we can laugh at the phylacteries and the long tassels and all of that stuff and think, how silly, how stupid, how foolish. Do we not do the same? Oh, maybe not you guys, maybe people at other churches. Like, you know, not you, right? <laughs> oh, uh-oh, maybe. Maybe some of us, right? That we emphasize the external rather than the internal. And, and, and Jesus is saying, don't do that. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord, what does he look at? He looks at the heart. And I think that's why they rejected Jesus, isn't it? Isaiah 53, verse 2 says, he has a form, he, excuse me, he has no form or comeliness, beauty. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. When they saw Jesus, he was unimpressive to behold. And they were so caught up on external appearances and favoritism and all that they thought, surely this man has nothing to offer us. And they rejected him out of hand. We, we recently studied James chapter 2 verses 1 through 9 on Sunday morning, which is all about that, you know, um, sin of partiality and being partial. So uh, I won't, we don't have time to get into James chapter 2, but may the Lord help us to not be partial, to not judge people on their outward appearances. 
To not see somebody and think, ah, surely, you know, this person is nothing, you know, it's going to be of no benefit to me, right? Well, (laughs) that's totally opposite of what it should be. How can I minister? How can I serve? And we'll get to that in just a moment. What else is going on with the hypocrisy of these religious leaders? Verse 6, they love the best places at the feast, the best seats in the synagogue. So at uh, social functions and at the synagogue, they would you know, get these places of honor for the, the, the rabbis, you know, the, the synagogue leaders, and they would set them up and, you know, get a big double portion of food and bring it to them with great pomp and circumstance. And, and these guys just literally, they ate it up. They loved it, right? And um, <clears throat> I've, I've been in situations similar to that, and it's, it's kind of uncomfortable. Uh, in, in Kenya, uh, again, you know, it's, it's important that we, we keep the intention and the heart of, of something in mind. But I believe it was in, in the people's way they wanted to honor the man of God, right? So if you went to a wedding, they would say, are there any pastors here, right? And it's like, mm, I'm a pastor. It's like, oh, yes, okay, all the pastors, stand up, come down. We want you to sit in front. Now, okay, Sure. You know, and then, like I said, you get this big plate of food and a big mug of tea, and they bring it to you, and, and their heart is to, to honor you and to, to honor the position of a pastor, and there's, there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with that. I give honor to whom honor is due, but the problem would be in the heart of the pastor, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, I want more of that, you know, and looking for ways to promote themselves, and that's what these men were about. Self-promotion. They would love to just be in the places of honor. They longed for the attention and honor for others at formal gatherings. They, they loved greetings, right? Notice this. Verse 7, greetings in the marketplaces. And to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi, or, you know, whatever titles people like. Seeking after titles, seeking after recognition. You know, and, and all of this is built on this really fragile ego, (laughs) lots of pride. And why are they doing this? Because they don't have the confidence that comes from the righteousness that we have in Christ. They had to make their own righteousness. And so they're trying to look the best as they possibly can to the outer world. They were trying to shore up their their fragile ego because in their pride, that's all they had to hang on to. All of their life hung upon what other people thought about them rather than what does God think? That's what I want. Maybe the world will reject me and despise me. And maybe I'll be foolish and lowly in the eyes of the world, but I want to honor God. I pray that that's your heart tonight. And that was the heart of Jesus. And that's what would become the heart of the disciples as they were filled with the Holy Spirit and became apostles. And you can read all about it in the book of Acts. But Jesus warned in John 5, he says, how can you believe, speaking to the Pharisees, how can you believe in God, in the Messiah, who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God, you see? You can't be seeking after the honor of the world and seeking after the honor of God at the same time. The two are mutually exclusive. You can't serve mammon and God at the same time. You got to choose one. Who will you serve? Who will you be living for? And that's what we see here that these Pharisees had chosen. Rather than truly serving God, they were just serving themselves and, and trying to promote themselves. So we continue on here. Jesus then gives some instruction for the people gathered. He says, these these fellows are hypocrites. These are the way that they're hypocrites. But you, verse 8, do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, the Messiah, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. In other words, what Jesus is teaching here is don't 
seek after titles. Don't seek after human recognition. Don't make this big deal about trying to jockey for position and one-up the other guy so that you have a position of power over him. That is not the way of the kingdom of God. Don't look for these impressive, you know, ways to kind of be impressive to other people. He says, man, it's, it's all about me, Jesus is saying. Don't look to, to put yourself in between God and man. Don't make it so that people need to come to you in order to get to God. There's one mediator, <laughs> and that is Jesus Christ, the righteous. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. So um, don't seek after those titles. So what should we do? Rather than being self-promoters, this is what Jesus tells us to do. Verse 11. But he who is greatest among you shall be your what? Are we all together? You okay? All right. You didn't sound very excited about that. <laughs> Servant. Yeah, oh boy. Not this again. <laughs> it's a common theme in Jesus' writings, isn't it? He who is greatest among you shall be your? servant and whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus had taught the same thing in Matthew 20 verses 25 through 28. He, the, the disciples are thinking, how can we, um, you know, get the best possible position? I don't have time to get into it. There's a couple of disciples who want to be at the right hand of, of Jesus when he comes to power and, and Jesus is shaking his head. No, 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 no. It's not about that. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your what? Servant. And whoever wishes to be the first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus is the ultimate servant. And he demonstrated that by going to the cross for us. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. That's 2 Corinthians 8, chapter 9. He humbled himself, gave up his uh, rights and privileges and came as a man. Why? For you and for me. To be the servant for us. So Jesus says, if you exalt yourself, it's not going to go well. It, it doesn't end well for you. You will be humbled. Self-exaltation, the scramble to the top, will actually be a path toward devastation in your life. Self-promotion will kill your spiritual growth will fill you with blinding pride and will cause your relationships to wither and die. And ultimately, when you stand before God, you'll be humiliated. That's what, that's what self-exaltation leads to. That's what Jesus is saying. But the reverse, the person who humbles themselves, who seeks to bless others in the face of cursing, who seeks to serve others rather than being served, the person who follows the pathway of Christ and laying down of his rights in order to bring reconciliation and forgiveness into people's lives, that is the path to life, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, in all ways. The humility causes you to see yourself as you really are and to see God as he really is. <clears throat> Humility gives us freedom to stop trying to hold up a front to the world, to stop trying to promote ourselves and rather promote Christ. A beautiful saying that John the Baptist said as, as Jesus was coming on the scene and more and more people were going after him and John's disciples are, are worried and saying, hey, there's more people going after Jesus. What, is, what does John say? Do you guys remember? He must and I must next time you're humbled. Okay, all right? 
Next time something happens to you that is just humbling to your pride, I want you to remember that verse, and I want you to just say it out loud. He must increase, I must decrease. I got home Thursday night, and uh, I looked in the mirror. I took my coat off. I looked in the mirror, and I realized my shirt was inside out. <laughs> I had taught. like I'd been around the young adults and laughing, fun, oh, making jokes. Ha, ha. And I realized I'm the joke. You know? <laughs> And I'm like, yep, he must increase, I must decrease, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm driving to church, and I happen to be praying, which, you know, I've been trying to pray more, okay? So I'm, I'm like, all right, I'm, Lord, I'm going to seek you. And rather than listening to podcast or music, Lord, just you're so good. And I'm taking a left onto 32, and apparently I kind of pulled up a little too close to a guy. I, I don't know, I didn't even realize it. And uh, he, he, green light, he goes about five miles an hour, like on Highway 32. And then he's going like 10 miles an hour. And all these cars are blowing by me. And I'm like, hmm, maybe he's got a, a cylinder out or something, you know. So finally he gets up about 25 miles an hour. And uh, it's clear for me to go. And so I go to the, past him, and he, go, he cuts me off. And I'm like, okay. So I go back, and he, he gets in front of me. And I'm like, I see. Okay. That's how it's going to be. All right, then. You know, right? What do you do, right? I mean, who, who do you think you are? You know? Do you, do you, know, do you know who I am? Like, you know? <laughs> no, I don't know. And I'm like, oh, this is perfect, right? This never happens to me. And yet what? When I'm praying, right, and I'm seeking after the Lord, this happens. So what do I say to myself? What are you going to say to yourself next time that happens, Right? And you've got to break the cycle of stupid. Okay, that's what I thought. I've got to break the cycle of stupid. If I act in kind, I'm just being like him. Like, what do I want to do? Like, pass him and like, you know, <laughs> shake my fist at him, you know, miss my turn, get in a fight. You know what I mean? Like, all these things run through my, not that I would do that. But in my flesh, <laughs> all these things are like, this is how road rage happens. And I'm like, no, Lord, bless this person. Clearly, there's something going on. Lord, help them. And help my heart because I'm mad. I'm frustrated. You know, I'm just talking to God about this. What needs to happen? I need to decrease so that the Lord can increase. The world does not need more of me. It needs more of Jesus, right? Amen? So that is what Jesus is getting at here. That's what the Pharisees did not understand. And the promise is that as we walk in that reality of humbling ourselves, of, of embracing those times of, of decrease, even if it comes in different forms of, of physical ailment, uh, financial difficulty, you're embarrassed. You know, somebody slights you. Humbling can take a lot of different forms. We need to say, yes, Lord, so that I can become more like Jesus because people spat in his face, right? They cursed him. They whipped him. You know, he, he went through the ultimate humbling, being the perfect son of God. And how did he respond? Lord, just heavenly flamethrower right now? That's what I would do. I mean, maybe not you guys, but you know. come on now. But Jesus... This is his heart. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That, we, we need that in our hearts. Okay, so. Whoever exalts himself is going to be humbled. He who humbles himself is going to be exalted. Now, we're kind of running short on time. But the rest of this chapter is really just a development of what Jesus has already kind of laid out in terms of their hypocrisy. We're going to see eight different woes. I'm going to move through these a little more quickly than usual. So kind of buckle your seatbelts and um, we'll go through these things together. The first woe. Now he goes from talking about the Pharisees to talk, talking directly to them. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe, Jesus is, he's brokenhearted. He's saying, Man, when judgment time comes, it is not going to be good for you. That's what woe means. It's not going to end well. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, you, you actors. 
you, you, those who wear a mask. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Literally, you shut the door on people's faces. That's what that means. You slam the door in people's faces who are seeking after God. They were to be the religious custodians, the spiritual custodians of the nation. They were supposed to be the ones leading the way to God. That was their role. And instead, they shut the way off to God, prevented people from going into it, and also locked themselves out as well. And, and what was that? Why? How was all that happening? They were preventing people from going to Jesus. They were making all kinds of accusations against Jesus, turning people away from Jesus, doing all that they could to thwart the ministry of Jesus. And, and that's the number one thing Jesus is, you are cutting people off from God, from their Messiah. Woe to you. Verse 14, second woe. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses. Look at this language. It's like a lightning bolt of, of rebuke here. Jesus does not pull any punches. This is the, the, the flame is in his eyes. You devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, just for a show, you make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive the greater condemnation. Devouring widows' houses, it's like they're animals, right? They, they're like beasts, and they're going after these poor, defenseless people as their prey. Widows represented the most needy people in, in any given society, right? And what are these fellas doing? They're going after them. They're saying, ah, here's an opportunity. We can get this woman's inheritance. We can get this woman's money. She is unstable. She's in a difficult position. And when she would need support, when she would need spiritual leaders and guidance to protect her from thieves and from those who would manipulate her, these guys were the thieves. They were the wolves licking their lips, seeing a tasty meal. And he's saying, yeah, cover it up with your long prayers. Yeah, it's a pretense. It's a cloak. Your religiousness is a cloak for your true heart, which is greed and therefore, Jesus says, because not, that would be bad if anybody did it, but because you're the religious leaders, because you represent the Lord, and when you do these things, you bring reproach on God, Jesus says, you are going to be judged more harshly. Wow, you're going to receive the greater condemnation. Third woe, verse 15, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, why? For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, that is to say one convert, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Can you believe this? Can you imagine being there, being a disciple and seeing this go down and like, whoa, we've never heard Jesus talk quite like this. It's remarkable. Make him twice as much as, as a son of hell as you. The fruit of their ministry, the proselytes, the people they gathered around him, he says, it's rotten to the core. Your ministry, rotten to the core. Verse 16, woe to you, blind guides, who say whoever swears by the temple, it's, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he's obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar, swears by it and all things on it. He who swears by the temple, swears by it and him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Notice what he says here in verse 17. You're fools. Or verse 16, rather. Woe to you, blind guides. Imagine somebody is going to lead you through a, a forest that's filled with, you know, um, critters that could eat you and, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, the, the, the guide says, he, he shows up and he's blind. He says, oh, I'm going to lead you through the forest. And he turns and he walks smack into a tree. And you're thinking to yourself, oh boy, we're in trouble, you know? 
That's the picture here. These guys, these Pharisees, were supposed to be guides. They were completely blind. Supposed to help people navigate through the difficulty of life. They're blind. And he gives an example of this. They would have these things where they would uh, make vows. And they say, ah, I swear by the temple that tomorrow I will blah, 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 blah. Right? And, and so they'd shake on it. And then tomorrow they break their promise. And the guy says, what gives, man? You said yesterday you swear by the temple. Ah, yes, I said by the temple. But I did not say by the gold of the temple. And therefore my promise, you know, it's, it doesn't actually mean what it says, what I said. You see, they were looking for ways to weasel out of their commitments. Looking for ways, looking for these little catches to kind of take advantage of people. How pathetic. How sad. Jesus says, fools. You know what that is in the Greek? Moros. You know what word we get in the English language? Moron. Yeah. Now, it's interesting because back in Matthew 5.22, Jesus says, be careful. You know, you call somebody this, you're, you're liable for the judgment. But Jesus is not saying this with the desire to destroy anybody's character. He's describing the reality of what's going on. And he's speaking of them as a class of people. So there's the distinction there. The intent behind what is being said is what truly matters. And Jesus' intent here is not to assassinate somebody's character. It's to call out sin and to describe what they are doing. And what they are doing, it's, it's foolish. It's, it's idiotic. It's, it's stupid. That, that's what Jesus is saying. And so he gives several examples here that all essentially um, show us the same thing. Number one, they were looking for, for cheap ways to get out of their commitments. And number two, they were completely materialistic. They were focused on material things, the gold of the temple, the sacrifice on the altar, and so on and so forth, rather than the Lord. Rather than being heavenly minded, they were very materialistically minded. So that's essentially what is being taught here. Verse 23, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of your mint and your anise and your cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. So they were very, uh, you know, fastidious about how they kept the law. They would count out their little herbs. They'd get their mint leaves. Okay, one for the Lord, nine for me. They'd get their anise, you know, these little seeds. Okay, one for God. You know, they, they would very, very particular, very, very fastidious. But Jesus says, you've completely missed the forest for the trees. You're so focused on this one little thing, you have neglected God's heart. Justice for the poor and needy. The weightier matters of the law. Mercy. Having mercy on people who are in need and being faithful to God and, and filled with faith. These are the things that God cares about. God isn't so much interested in your herb garden, right? <laughs> what he cares about is your heart. Is your heart for the Lord? Are you completely sold out to him? And, and that is absolutely essential for us. We don't get caught up in these kind of religious games and, and keeping of these rules so that, okay, well, I've done my duty and now I can kind of do what I want. No, it doesn't work like that. God wants all of you, every single part of you. Verse 24, it, 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 again, it's these, these funny um, pictures. They would, they would strain out their, their wine. They would pour their wine through like a cheesecloth type of thing. Why? Oh, just in case there's some kind of insect that flew in there. We don't want to be ceremonially unclean, right? But then they're like chowing down on camel for lunch, you know? Oh, man, this camel's delicious. Well, why would that be a problem? Camel's unclean animal, right? If the gnat is a problem, 
then why are you chowing down on the camel, guys? Essentially is what he's saying. You have neglected the weightier matters of the law and you are unclean in heart and in mind before the Lord. That's what he is saying. Verse 25, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also. Wow. Imagine you go over to somebody's house, right? And they, they say, oh, this is our finest china, you know, handed down from generation to generation. We want to bring it here. And all oh, the outside's so beautiful. They bring it to you. And like inside is like all this dust, you know, like uh, cockroaches in there, upside down, you know. And they come to ladle out the food, right? Whoa, 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 whoa. Ha, can I get a clean dish, please? You know, outside looks great. Inside's disgusting. Ain't no way I'm going to eat from this and Jesus is saying that's what hypocrisy is. That's the, that's the picture of hypocrisy. Oh, the outside looks good. What's going on on the inside? And I think that's an important question for us. Lord, search my heart. What's going on? Oh, I might say everything's good to everybody, but is everything really good? Lord, is everything good with me and you? Or, or am I playing religious games? God doesn't just want a pretty outside. He's interested in cleansing your heart and dealing with the issues that are going on inside of you. And how does that happen? The work of the Spirit. When I stop focusing on the outside and I say, Lord, cleanse me, do your work, do what you need to do inside. I invite you into my life. I invite you into this situation. Do what only you can do change my heart. Jesus develops the picture here in verse 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. But he's really going to lower the boom on this one. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. You know what's so powerful about this? During the Passover... This is the Passover time. You know what they would do? Because they got all these, you know, pilgrims coming in from all over the place. And, and sometimes, like, if a person died out in the middle of a field, they'd have to bury him right there. And, and so they'd make a big pile of rocks. You know, watch out. Don't go around this area. Why? Because if, if, as a pilgrim, you're walking by and you touch a tomb, well, now you're ceremonially unclean and you've traveled all this way and now you can't participate in the Passover celebration. So what would they do? Ah, we'll whitewash all the tombs. So before Passover, as people are coming in, there would be people, all kinds of people, whitewashing the tombs. The whitewash was still fresh on the graves when Jesus made this statement. It would be fresh in everybody's mind. There would be whitewashed tombs everywhere. You're just like that. Can you imagine the blood rising in these Pharisees' faces? The embarrassment, those people who were so interested in their outward appearance to other people. And now Jesus is humiliating them. This is powerful. And I'm not sure I need to develop the picture too much. What's going on? Outward, everything looks good. What's going on on the inside? It's dead. There's death and decay. May the Lord help us. You know what he can do with dead bones though, right? He can speak life. Man, he can raise up dead bones. If you're feeling like dead bones on the inside tonight, I want you to take heart. Jesus has the power of resurrection. He can bring you back to life. So, verse 28, even so outwardly you appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy, lawlessness. Verse 29, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you, you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. And you say, oh, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. You know, they're, they're weeping about these dead prophets whom their fathers killed. Apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Here they are weeping about this. And what are they doing at the exact same time? They're planning on how to kill Jesus. 
Hello? Hypocrisy. <laughs> oh, man, we wouldn't have done what they did. <laughs> you are. You're, you're just, it, it couldn't be more obvious. Verse 31, therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Verse 32, this is crazy. Fill up then, finish the job, Jesus is saying. Go ahead, finish it. The cup isn't quite full of God's wrath to be poured out on this place. What? Go ahead and do what you're planning on doing. And what's he talking about? They're planning on killing him. And Jesus knows this and they know it too. Yeah, Jesus was tough, man. He was, <laughs> he was brave. Calling you out, fill up. Then the measure of your father's guilt, what will be the result? We'll see in a moment. Verse 33, serpents, brood of vipers. You know what a brood is? Offspring. Your dads were serpents. They killed the prophets and you're the brood. You're the offspring of those prophets, or excuse me, of those men who killed the prophets. And very similar thing that, that John the Baptist said about these guys in, in Matthew chapter three, verse seven. He called them a brood of vipers as well. Been three years, three and a half years of Jesus's ministry. Not much has changed. <laughs> How can you escape the condemnation of hell? That's where you're headed. How are you gonna escape? There's one way to escape. Anybody know? Jesus, repent. Repent, turn to Jesus. Verse 34, therefore indeed, I send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. This is a prophecy and you know what it's talking about, right? It's talking about the book of Acts. If you read the book of Acts, this is exactly what happened. Jesus sends prophets, he sends their apostles out and just read it in Acts chapter seven. Stephen is stoned and then a great persecution arises in the church. Acts chapter 12, James is killed. Great persecution is gonna happen. And Jesus says, I'm gonna continue to send you people, but it's not gonna be any better for them. Verse 35, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. On this generation, on this nation, judgment is going to fall. It's gonna take place. We don't, Abel, of, of course, is from Genesis chapter four. This man who's mentioned Zechariah, son of Berechiah, we don't have time to get into it. There's some different theories about who he could be, but the long and short of it is this. You have Abel to, Zechariah, A to Z, basically, <laughs> right? Kind of works out in the English language. All these prophets you have murdered, you have killed, you're planning on killing me, and what's gonna happen when you do it, the judgment of God is going to fall on this place. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this nation. And what's interesting is Matthew 24 begins, Jesus begins to detail the judgment that would fall upon the nation as a result of their murder of the Messiah. But notice Jesus' heart in all of this. Notice verse 37. I know it's been a heavy chapter and I know I'm going long, but notice the heart of Jesus here. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He's weeping. He's brokenhearted. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her what was the heart of Christ? How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. So tender. Oh, I wanted to be your provision, your protection. I wanted to be your blessing. That's what I wanted. But you were not willing. All day long, God says, I've stretched out my hands towards a rebellious generation. And that's the heart of God. His hands are stretched out. He's inviting you tonight to come under the shadow of his wings to find protection and safety. Are you willing? That's the question. Verse 38, see, your house is left to you desolate. That's the result of their rejection. We'll, and we'll talk more about this, Lord willing, next week. Verse 39, for I say to you, you shall not see me, excuse me, you shall see me no more 
till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They would not, Jesus will return when the nation of Israel recognizes him as the Messiah and calls upon him for their salvation. So that's what we're waiting for. That's what we're praying for. We'll talk more about that at a later time. But I know, I know, just try not to pay attention to the clock right now, okay? <laughs> just pretend like it's not there, okay? We're going to take communion, all right? Powerful chapter, but, but we need to take communion tonight, okay? We can't, we can't study this chapter and then just kind of go on our way. We need, we need this. So I'm going to ask the guys to pass out communion, and this will be a time for you to just, Lord, search my heart, do, you know, speak what you need to speak, Thank Jesus that, that he died for you, his blood was shed for you, and right now, anyone in this room who has yet to do this can call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, rescue me. Save me from my, the judgment of my sins. You just call upon him. Communion is a celebration of what Christ has done, the new covenant, to cleanse the inside, to give us a new heart, Right? That's what we're celebrating. So as we, we take communion, as you get the elements, hold them, that's what we want to be meditating on. That's what we want to be thinking on. So you guys can start 